Welcome back to Kalei Lou's at 432 The Drop Radio. We're going right in on the same, you know, book full of art, filled with artifacts. You know, they said, where's the artifacts, bro? Where's the Hebrew artifacts? Well, we got a book filled with primary docs, documentation. Love to Cyclone Covey. Also validated in the book Forbidden Histories of America by Daniel Lowe. And you put them two together, and oh boy, you, you, you're popping off, man. You, you got your recon about the Americas. We're going to decipher through Covey's work. You know, we ain't got to agree with, it. you know, all the things, but we're going to get some dropout. We're going to get some babies out the bathwater, like we always say. And the book is called Kalelus, a Roman Jewish colony in America from the time of Charlemagne through Alfred the Great. And we saying these ain't white people. <laughs> it's a copper color cons. So who he calls colonists or who he calls Jewish or all these things, Roman. We see it with a dragonfly perspective that this America is popping off, you know what I'm saying, um, you know, in the heart of the Preston John flow leading up to that 1165 letter of Preston John talking about, you know, he's in this beautiful, magical, mystical place. And he got the fountain of youth. Took six baths in the fountain of youth. So that's 1165. He took six baths in the fountain of youth to get back to the age of 32. Him and his whole entire tribe. So that pushes him easily into the 600s, 700s. Right now we're picking up around the, you know, mid-700s. And let's talk about these Hebrew artifacts and put it together. Surfing away. Page 40. According to the garbled Latin of the Arizona artifacts, the late 8th century migration from Rome to the unknown land, Kalelu, occurred during the 14th year reign of the King Theodore, a man of great courage who had been born in Rome where his reign Evidently began in 765. No details of the voyage or landfall are mentioned or whether the getaway had been surreptitious or with the papal connivance. The colonists found Chief Toltexas or the Toltexas Aborigines controlling an extensive area. So right there, he's calling Theodore a colonist king or a colonist as if, uh, you know, Britain and Europe in the 700s did not all belong to Preston John. The, the three Indias is what they call it. So all this is the kingdom, Asia here, Asia there. These are all copper colored cons. So, you know, they've been having a vortex. They've been connecting. So this is a family war. We got Davids in Britain. We got Davids in Russia. We got, you know, Davidic lines throughout the three Indias. So you can't, you know, mark out, oh, he's over there in Rome. You know what I'm saying? Like, which Rome, you know, what Romani are popping off? What Israelite, you know, cons, you know what I'm saying, are holding down whatever the vortex, whatever the, the secrets, whatever the kingdom is, whatever the code, you know, the code they're keeping, like, this is happening in all these lands. You know, all these lands are connected, by the way, especially back then. So, you know, you got maps where you taking the, uh, you know, Anion, <laughs> you know, Anion this way, or you can, you know, hop through Greenland and connect. Well, you know, that's the long way. You know what I'm saying? So all this is connected. So don't think of any disconnect, especially right here in the 8th century. That's all we say. That these are colonists coming in selling across the Atlantic Ocean, you know what I'm saying? This is already a connection. Landmass is connected. Told Texas and Theodorus all belong to the Davidic line. So you have a power struggle going on 
in the David kingdom at this time. That's what we see. They see it as black and white or really just white. <laughs> but let's go. I'm just going to read it. I'm just going to read it. So Sylvanus told Texas, according to Daniel Lone and Forbidden Histories of America, is Solomon the Builder, a.k.a. King Solomon. And if this is Solomon David's bond, then you see how by the time they in 1165 saying they took six baths in the fountain of youth. Managa, by the time they saying they took six baths in the fountain of youth, even those that were damn near a thousand years old, they're easily popping off at this time. And then you have the validation with this Solomon popping off way over here in the 8th century, 700s in America, in the same place that Preston John Condawee's popping off. Now, back to the script, you know. Was there ever a David on David skirmish? You know what I'm saying? Of course, man. Especially when the kingdom was divided with the whole Sheba, you know, situation or Bathsheba. You know what I mean? And then you got Absalom fighting his father. That's a David on David war right there. So, you know, these things are happening in the script. And you compare it to real history or the real story correlating these type of wars right here in America. You know, this might not be our original timeline, but we can at least start pinpointing some of these dates in the investigation. So Theodorus found Totexas of the Totexas Aborigine. Shout out to the Nagas in Totexas, Texas stand up. So they're controlling an extensive area and stood in vain at the edge of the recently founded city. Rhoda. So this is not Rhode Island on the East Coast. It's the whole kingdom of Rhoda right here in the four corners on the so-called West Coast. Yeah, man. <laughs> so these Rhodons, it says they were found... Um, or this kingdom Rhoda against a native uprising. Sylvanus now have been the name of the victorious chief. Sylvanus is Salema or Shaloma. The word may also imply forest Indians. <laughs> Nagas in the wilderness, huh? <clears throat> forest Indians, okay. Or their advance through woods. Uh huh. Theodore marshaled his forces but could not hold. The Indians led away more than 700 captives, yet evidently forbore to loot the city's gold. I mean, so what's happening here? So you got Theodore Roos, also of the Makir line of the Davidic princes. And he's at war with this Solomon situation. Now, wasn't the kingdom divided after Solomon? I mean, it's a lot of correlations. We're just digging on. And it says these Indians. Now, are they talking about Solomon's Indians? <laughs> Solomon's Nagas? Or are they talking about Theodorus's Nagas? But some Indians led away more than 700 captives. But they did not loot the city's gold. Now, what does that tell you? That they was on a whole nother type of moral compass, right? They weren't there for the gold. <laughs> they used to go. They're Indians, right? They're, they're indigenous cons. Now, what side of the war? David on David. You know, where they fighting on? Now, it says, quoted here, no gold is taken away. Could instead mean a refusal to pay bribes or a tribute. Nah, or it just means no gold was taken away. They can't even conceive why no gold would be taken away, why the city wouldn't be looted. But that's just not, not that ain't how we, you know, that wasn't our motivation. You know what I'm saying? We had to set the record straight. You know what I'm saying? We had to stand on our on our spiral. You know, sometimes it had to be David on David. 
but it wasn't no looting of the gold and torturing the, the families and all this stuff. You know, they were captives, you know, carry captives here, carry captives there. But, you know, you don't hear about them being mutilated like the Columbus shit or, you know what I'm saying, some type of uh, Cortez situation, you know what I mean? So they were still protecting their captives. It was still family. At the foot of the city implies that Rhoda stood on a height. A different inscription further describes the site as fronting a plain rung by hills. Theodore, or Theodore Roos, must have fallen in the battle, which therefore must have taken place in 779 A.D. in America, my night. These ain't, man, look. <coughs> <laughs> I know I told you I'm, a, I'm just going to read it. I just got to, you know, you know, drop you popping off. You know. These can't be no Jews of today. I mean, can we be clear about that? These can't be no Jewish people of today. They were not fighting in these type of battles and wars. <laughs> they weren't wielding these type of swords and these type of kingdoms in America. So when they found these artifacts, first they put it in the New York Times in the 1920s. We read that in a great book called The uh, uh, the Merchant of Rhoda, I believe it's called. You know what I mean? So first they published it as if they could take credit for it. Then they took it down and they swept it under the rug. And they don't talk about these artifacts in America with Hebrew on them no more. They don't claim them no more because this will have to put them in straight up identity theft. They will have to now claim... <laughs> To be this total Texas Sylvania situation, which means that they, the Jewish people of today, the German Jews of today, <laughs> will have to now claim that they are of the Toltecs. I just want you to hear how, why they're sweeping it under the rug, why they're not claiming this stuff. <clears throat> they will have to claim that they're the Toltecs, that they're the ones that got rolled up on and Yada, yada, yada. And these are their artifacts. These are the Romani, you know, colonies. But the colonies don't mean they're indigenous. So they keep putting the word colony, colonizer, but they're putting on the wrong people. They're the colonizer. <laughs> but, they're, but they're claiming your identity as if they got colonized. Oh, the colonizer, Theodorus, man. It's a family war. You got nothing to do with it. You can't call nobody. You can't call nobody a colonizer. It's not your place. It's for the indigenous people to tell you who's jamming them up, who's on their land uninvited, <clears throat> who's on their land that don't belong here. That's 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 our responsibility to tell you who's colonizing us. Reading through this wing wham, sometimes you just got to make it clear. So the Jewish people of today are not these people in 779 fighting this war in America doing all this stuff. They're, they're still in our history, man, right in our face, Paul. Like I said, they're just now being converted in the 700s, converted, because King Bulan didn't want to convert to Islam or Christianity. So he said, I'll, I'll take the one in the middle. I'll, I'll take the Hebrew stuff. I'll convert to Judaism. Now you got these Jewish people popping off after that time. They don't, <laughs> they weren't some organized kingdom of, of, of Hebrews and Jews and ruling in America and Going to war in this in these Davidic wars. Stop it, man. I just had to tell I just had to tell you. Let's go. Lego. So they can't tell us who's colonizing who. You know, they're just trying to write a story about our story through their lens, through their perspective. <clears throat> All right, here we go. So the battle must have taken place in 779, the final year of his reign, talking Theodorus. And when you read the story of Theodorus, you realize he's also called Machir, and his father's also called Machir. So this line of Machirs is going through them, and they're also being called, Machir is also being referred to as Mixco you know what I'm saying? So you have an indigenous flow of these Machirs, so it's letting you know that this war, who he's calling a colonizer of Sylvanus told Texas, is Mixcaoto. So this war that's happening, <laughs> this beef that's happening, you know, is this 
to Texas, Mexico, old to it's all Davidic beef. You know, it's all it's all in house. You know, they're they're discovering artifacts and writing about it, man. All right, you, you got a third party on a third party trying to write about us. In that year, an energetic warrior king, Jacob, identified as a native of Britain, which again is part of the three Indias, and we had Hebrews there, Jacob was there, David was there. And Britain means covenant. Britain means the covenant. So he succeeded and for six years renewed Rhoda while counteracting the enemy, fighting much himself in the front lines and tending to everything. So, hey, Jacob was on the front lines, bodies on bodies in Kalelus. Moshe is left on a baby. So he fought on the front lines. He died, no doubt, violently in 785 when Israel the first, who had been born on the Sinai, but who must have been but a boy in 785, assumed the crown. So Israel the first assumed the crown at the time that Jacob, who had been reigning for six years at that time, fighting on the front lines, he died in battle. The year 790, which O.L. records without comment. O.L. is uh, one of the you know, folks that's originally given some uh, recordings or drop on these artifacts. So he must have been memorial, memorable for Israel's decisive victory, which subjugated the told Texas to his rule. On January 1st, 800, in any case, he presided over a council of allied colonial cities, which could field a total of 700 troops. He enjoyed a sufficient sway with sufficient security to turn his attention to the development of the priesthood. We're talking priest cons. He enjoyed a sufficient sway. All right, with sufficient security to turn his attention to the development of the priesthood, one cross memor memorializes Joseph and Saul without an accompanying legend. So they're talking artifacts that have Joseph on them, King Saul on them. <laughs> right? So it's a David on David war. You know, David's coming after King Saul, right? So all this. It's on these artifacts in America, in Arizona, that the Arizona, Arizona State Museum is drowning. You know what I'm saying? The University of Arizona is drowning. The Smithsonian is drowning. No one's talking about it. Again, they tried to claim these, or they did, live in your face, but in the 20s, in the 20s, in New York City. <laughs> so they say no play play. This was a big deal. But they ain't talking about it. And it was a hundred years ago. All this is happening at the same time as the GE Kincaid Grand Canyon excavations. So these 20s and 30s was a big time of exploration. Even the Admiral Byrd stuff was popping off. The August Picard stuff was popping off, man. The Giannini flow. Worlds beyond the pole. They were exploring everything in the 20s and 30s. And now what? They just stopped. Or we don't hear about it. It's called SpaceX and NASA now, right? Okay. Now they're going out of space. Okay. okay. You went from exploring the unknown here to suddenly you're exploring extraterrestrial worlds. Oh, okay. <laughs> Man, this is play play. Let's go. Talking to artifacts that memorialize Joseph and Saul without an accompanying legend. So it doesn't have, like, they can't really decipher why and what's being said. The crown and the word laudator, L A U D A T U R, may rather, or uh, which, which give a first impression that they were kings may rather symbolize their royal allegiance and appointment as success, successive chief priests 
or priest kings, my naga, prestors, during the 67 year reign of Israel the first. <clears throat> so O O L likely succeeded his teacher father, who presumably spoke Anglo Saxon and Vulgate Latin, had learned to write classical Latin and knew some Hebrew, so he must know some Hebrew. These are Hebrew artifacts in Arizona. War had resumed when Israel died in 852, evidently in his 80s, Israel II, a man surely by now also elderly, reigned six years. Israel III, Septimus, seventh, right? Talk to seven cities ago. Ain't, ain't there a Septimus Severus, right? They, they always bring up in Rome over there. Ooh. Led some rebellion or something like that, right? So just look at the duplications, right? This is Septimus, who's also called Israel the Third, who's popping off in the 800s in America, my not. <laughs> make it make sense. In the inscription, Septimus is an obvious, oh, they, they want to call it an obvious mistake. <laughs> Obviously, huh? <laughs> These people don't know what they're talking about. Nothing could be obvious <laughs> when you don't know what you're talking about. You can't even decipher how can something be an obvious mistake. So that's a big red flag for me. We got to connect this Israel the third Septimus situation and see what the story is that they're giving the other Septimus. You know what I mean? Let's go. They say it's a mistake for what's called Tertius, T-E-R-T-I-U-S. A miscopy, miscopy, M-I-S-C-O-P-Y, miscopy from the sand-drawn original or one of O.L.'s lapses was a strapping 26 when he took over in 858. So other than the conjecture that they hit us with, what we know is that Israel III took over in 858. He was 26 years old. He reestablished sovereignty over the Toltecs and became the first king to treat them as friends. <laughs> Maybe because they were friends. Maybe they was all the same family. In or before 880, he culminated his long and flourishing reign by granting them independence. For this treasonous act, some kind of Sanhedrin banished him. So because he gave his family back their things, you know, something within this Sanhedrin, this council, you know, banished him. So Israel IV proceeded to resubjugate the total Texas for nothing but peace determined to conquer or die. The tide of the mutually <clears throat> Shalak, uh, exterminative war turned against him in 883 when his people took refuge from their villages and fields inside the walls of their principal city. While professedly not entirely hopeless in the depressing siege of overwhelming superior numbers during the next several years clinging to faith in the Lord, they also recognized inevitable doom. About 888, old O.L. recalled it had been a hundred years since Jacob ruled so table turningly as if it as if feeling the lack of a vigorous Jacob now. They're just talking about what's on their artifacts, man. At, so all this story is written on artifacts in Arizona. I mean, that's really all we need to know. Everything else is a bonus. <laughs> that you got stories of Jacob, stories of Saul, Israel the fourth, the third, the, the second, the first, Sylvanus to Texas, Solomon, all on artifacts in Arizona that the Arizona State Museum, Arizona University of Arizona, all these, uh, you know, excavators and archaeologists, all these big wigs, Smithsonian, everybody know about this stuff. Ain't no one teaching us about it. They swept this thing over the rug, under the rug <laughs> for over 100 years. 100 years, we're just bringing it back up. They're taking down links off the Internet. They're trying to, you know, cover this cover this mystery up, right? 
Who's Israel the first? Who's Israel the third? Who's Israel the fourth? All these are major figures in history that have been duplicated, phantoms in the future. Or they pushed it back to the past even further in the BCs. Now you're reading about King David, King Solomon in around what, 700 BC, something crazy, 600 BC. When all that could be popping off in 600 AD. That's a thousand year swing, at least. <laughs> And now they push his, they push history back at least sometimes eight hundred years. So anything in between, you gotta investigate it because it might be a phantom and duplication. Sometimes they only went back three hundred years and put something in the fifteen hundreds that belonged in the eighteen hundreds, or they took it from the fifteen hundreds and pushed it back three hundred years from that and put it in the twelve hundreds. We see in this case with Esteban, St. Stephen, popping off in 200. He's popping off in 1500. It's a thousand years difference at least. So this is Scholar Gurn Patavis' mess. We're just cleaning it up. Love to Anatoly Fomenko, the Russian chronographer. We got all them Anatoly Fomenko drops in the drop library. Love to Aqua Tai Bazan. Go get it at 432thedrop.com. Password is one, two, Three, four. Oh boy. Let's get a little more of this. Let's get a little more of this. It's getting good to me. So Israel the fourth proceeded to what they say resubjugate. Or did he, you know, pretty much put his dominion down, you know what I'm saying? These are again David on David Wars. Uh says quote unquote nothing but peace. Since the tide of the mutually exterminative war turned against him in 883, when his people took refuge from their villages and fields inside the walls of the principal city, while professedly not entirely hopeless in their depressing siege of overwhelmingly superior numbers during the next several years, clinging to faith in the Creator, they also recognized inevitable doom. At 888, old O.L. recalled it had been a hundred years since Jacob ruled so table turningly as it as if feeling the lack of a vigorous Jacob now. O.L. recalls the colony's heyday under Israel the first when they had life and dominion in the year 895. He realized he might not be able to accomplish his task of memorializing the colony. Presumably, quote, it is uncertain how long life will continue. The war still ra rages. 3,000 have been slain. The leaders with their principal men have been captured. If O.L.'s final date, 900 were more than a hoped for round number, Israel the fourth must have managed a respite which prolonged the siege of Rhoda for five years. Bodies on bodies in Kalelus. Naga on Nagas being slain. David on David, just like in biblical times, bodies was falling. You see that we out of code, right? We murdering our own brothers. We out of code. You know, a little piece of this we'll get and continue with this next time in Calais Luz on page 43, discussing artifacts, self de Self-disclosure, so this is the artifact self-disclosure, quote-unquote, Deuteronomy. Okay. Notwithstanding the crudity of the Latin and the portrait portraiture of the crosses, anyone who directly observes and handles the artifacts cannot but be impressed by the painstaking loving care which wrought them. Whoa. So these artifacts are so beautiful, so 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 well crafted that it's noted, even if they're dated in the seven hundreds A.D., <laughs> that you're pulling them out. Wait, you're pulling stuff out the ground.
from damn near 1300 years ago and it's still impressively made i just need to, I, I need you to wrap your noodle around what you what you popping off with my nagas because this is your story this is what's happening in america nagas on nagas bodies on bodies it's all happening it's a more and more war everything's happening right so <laughs> Anyone who directly observes or handles the artifacts cannot but be impressed by the painstaking, loving care that wrought them, that, that created them. Then his minutest examination can detect nothing anachronistic in the early medieval style of their paleography or symbolism. Beside the names of the kings, much else on the gun barrel, blue to light lead, gray artifacts concern or confirm the colony to have been Jewish. <laughs> this is when drops start popping up, but I'm going to keep going. So the colony must be Jewish because they got Hebrew confirming that it's Jewish. No. Why can't these be Hebrews, not Jewish, Judaism people that they need? They need the Jewishness. They need the Judaisms to connect them to so-called white people today to make these white artifacts, make this evidence of white people in America. No, we're not going to let you do that, man. These are Hebrews. You got nothing confirming that they're not Hebrews and that they're Jewish converts. Them coming on boats don't confirm that they're Jewish converts. Nagas was visiting Nagas on boats all the time. Perhaps they were reaching a part, you know, that was unknown to them. But it doesn't mean that the entire land was unknown. Maybe a section that they were, that they themselves, not their ancestors, not their fathers, maybe it was unknown to them. You know what I'm saying? Like, we don't, we're trying to transfer <laughs> from these, you know, uh, linguists, you know, that supposedly are transfer. We're trying to dissect <laughs> translations. You know what I'm saying? From hijacks, you know what I'm saying? So when they say unknown, we don't really know what it says. We don't know if it says unknown. They're just using conjecture to put stuff in here. So don't get swayed by the malarkey. We hijack free. This is what we do now. That these Hebrew artifacts, <laughs> you know, a menorah with seven burning candles. A pair of Hebrew goblet chalices. Habdalah. H-A-B-D-A-L-A-H. Might be an inscription on these chalices, okay. You got incense spoons. So this is all priestly, you know, flow. Burning incense. Numerals. I to X and double column surely signify the Ten Commandments. Uh oh. A bunch of priestly stuff they find. Priest king stuff they find. So they got the Ten Commandments. <laughs> they got the incense spoons. They got the goblets, the chalices, the menorah. And words in carefully drawn square Hebrew script, including shalom or peace, kadosh, kadash, gadash, holy or he is holy, Elohim or hawa, goi gadol, g o i g a d o l, which means a great nation, etc. The colonists or who they're calling colonists, evidently represented a heretical Jewish sect, <laughs> or they represent Hebrew Nagas already here. They can't even get that right. They, they can't see that. They're trying so hard to confirm their identity and confirm uh, these people the more they push it to these people must be coming over some giant waterway. The more it seems like it was them that's putting colonies in different places. 
just like we told Horace Butler. <laughs> crossing over water doesn't mean crossing over the Atlantic. You got no evidence about Atlantic, but the conjecture, I <laughs> love to the tip, law, you know, that you put in our heads make us automatically think Atlantic Ocean, you know, must have been coming from Rome over the Atlantic Ocean. Like, you could be crossing any waterway. We don't even know what the landscape was looking back then. If North Americans or even North America, so-called North America, had huge amounts of water going through it. So you can't just jump and assume we're talking Atlantic Ocean, man, just to bring you into the picture, just to connect you. Nothing is what it seems. If you see Britain on an artifact in 700, it doesn't mean Britain that you know of today. Ethiopia ain't Ethiopia, China ain't China, and India ain't India. Because we're in India superior. Nothing's what it seems. So these people want to assume their way into paradise, assume their way into being Jewish <laughs> and uh, these Israelite kingdoms in America. The colonists evidently represented a heretical Jewish sect. <laughs> so we got to assume that they're colonists. <laughs> assume that they are heretical. <laughs> or we're just talking about heritage of Hebrews, not Jewish sect. Their central symbol of the cross or the Tau, last letter of the Hebrew, is a cross or a Tau. Not Christianity, Hebrew. Tau, although not unknown to the Hebrew tradition, was atypical. Fred Horton of the Wake Forest Department of Religion recognized in 1971. So Managa, they still had experts coming in, examining these artifacts, even in the 70s. They just ain't talking about it today. So this Fred Horton in the Wake Forest Department of Religion recognized in 1971 that two of the crosses, artifacts 18 and 20, were Nahushtans. Uh-oh. Now we get into the dragon drop. Told y'all we had Hebrew artifacts and we had dragons on them too. They'll call them snake, reptiles, all these other things. <laughs> Anagas. These are dragon swords and dragon artifacts. Let's go. They call them Nahushtans, right? Which had ceased to be orthodox from the time King Hezekiah broke the one in the temple that the people were burning incense, incense to in 2 Kings 18. So what does that tell you for the dismount? I mean, were these people burning incense to a snake? This idolatry, this rule number one, these graven images were representing something. A lot of things start off innocent. You know, they think, oh, okay, this dragon that Moses made, this copper serpent, brazen serpent, which is a copper dragon <laughs> that gave the tribe life by breathing that fire. <laughs> Whoever it breathed on, what they call bit, they translated it. To biting, but we're talking about a stinging. A bite is a sting, all in etymology. So, are they being bit by a snake or stung by the fire of this copper dragon? Make it make sense. So, once Hawa allows such miracles to take place, especially with dragons, some people do go off and start worshiping the dragon instead of worshiping the creator who created the dragon, like a Leviathan or a Tiamat or any of that. You know, it starts off innocent. It starts off to protect you. But the issue is that the people need to see something powerful to worship. And since, you know, they don't, they're not privy to being in Hawa's throne room and being face to face with our creator, with Hawa, then they worship the next best thing that symbolizes the creator's, uh, you know, creations. You know, and this is when we go off into idolatry, graven images. Then you forget about Hawa and you just got your idol. Now, you're not even worshiping the dragon. You're just worshiping the graven image that represents the dragon <laughs> that's supposed to represent Hawa's mercy on you 
that he even allowed Moshe to create a copper dragon to save you, or you know, sent them dra sent them dracons in Psalms 18 to save you. You know, these dragons are always coming to save you, but we keep going off and worshiping them. They're supposed to be guardians to us, and until we get that right, we can't have these guardians because we're gonna go off again and start worshiping them because it's easier to get to them than the Creator, right? And that's the issue. And they're going to touch on the Moses flow. Let's go. So the idol that came from these dragons was broken by King Hezekiah. It ain't that he had an issue with the dragon. He had an issue with the graven image that's being worshipped in the temple in 2 Kings 18, verse 4. That was... That one was the staff which brazen serpent Moses purportedly. So that's the staff with the brazen serpent that Moses purportedly had used as a snake bite, <laughs> healing charm in the desert migration of the children of Israel. We just got that. This wasn't no snake bite healing charm. This dragon was put in that fire, but this fire was like a healing fire. It's like a healing dragon. <laughs> and whoever you got. You know, whoever got hit about his frequency, they got to live. Just read Numbers 21. You did. It says the two lead cross Nahustians found in desert Arizona have a little rattlesnake made of lead coiled around each. The reverse of number 18. Now, who's calling it a rattlesnake? Again, they there. This is all their conjecture. This is what they're adding <laughs> to something that should be up to our interpretation. But now we got rattlesnake in our head. They got rattlesnakes on them. No big deal. <laughs> Not dragons. Just a rattlesnake. Now these dragons could be worms, right? W Y R M. They have no wings. Not all dragons got wings. Some, you know, take the more, you know, snake like appearance. You know, some got got two feet. Two legs and they run around like dinosaurs. Some are flying dragons. Some are, um, you know, uh, marine dragons, you know, like Leviathan in the water. Different dragons, different sizes. Some are small, some are big. It's not a rattlesnake, man. <laughs> That's all we say. So they're talking about artifact number 18. And the obverse of artifact number 20 adds an engraving of a striking snake or dragon together with two crawling snakes or dragons. So it's a striking dragon together with two crawling dragons. They call snakes. All right. The two Nehushtans both repeat the elsewhere occurring bishop's cap. And before they said, is it a bishop's cap or a Hebrew headdress? I didn't say it. They said it earlier. In this book, so they don't know if it's a bishop's cap or a Hebrew headdress, but now they're just calling it a bishop's cap when they just said earlier that it could also be a Hebrew headdress. So we'll call it a Hebrew headdress. <laughs> so the two Nehushtans both repeat that the elsewhere occurring Hebrew headdress with Latin L on its side. Number 20 repeats it along with L-I underneath, which appears on many of the other artifacts. The Memorial Chronicle crosses prepare, prepare us to understand the L as Laudador for the I include Eof or Josephus. Oh, Josephus. <laughs> we got Joseph. Also spell I O S E P H U S or Isaacus, Isaac, I S A A C U S, and they got Judas or Judah, but they spell it I U D A. So you got Judah, you got Israel, and you got Joseph, all with these two dragons, <laughs> Nehushtans, on artifact number 20. And artifact number 18. Otherwise, we would have taken it for Libertus or Lex. On ancient Roman milestones, it stood for Legionis Imperator. Back to the emperor. 
the perhaps more provocative recurring symbol found engraved on three swords. All right, so <laughs> now we're talking swords. Went, went from talking crosses, now specifically we're talking swords, and we're talking the Hustians on the swords, dragon swords. Found engraved on three swords on one of the memorial crosses, one of the Nehushtans and largest and clearest on the labyrinth is the geometrically designed, geometrical design, which seems to have served as the colonial kingdom's coat of arms. It could be the floor plan of the temple. Uh oh. Uh oh, or ground plan of its territory altogether. If the latter, it ought to indicate an irregular contour of the Santa Cruz in relation to the fields, but does not in any case exhibit. So he's saying if it was the latter, it could be the floor plan of the temple or the ground plan of its territory. So. He's saying it can't be the ladder, it can't be the ground plan, it must be the floor plan of the temple. Which temple, man? We're talking about, you know, the Ten of Meaning Temple, Solomon's Temple, you see what I'm saying? This is what these swan knights is popping off. You know, turns into what, what's called the Temple or later, but all popped off as the swan knights, man. These swan knights, I mean, we got to really dig deep on these swan knights. You know, these are Solomon's vessels, you know. All this is Solomon's uh, army, you know what I'm saying? So they're also the protectors, you know. They're holding the secrets down, protecting the secrets of Solomon and the floor plan of the temple. For the dismount. In any case... It exhibits a central square approximately quartered, each quarter subdivided by diagonals or horizontals or verticals with a projecting smaller square, each subdivided by diagonals on each side. Labeled Britannia on the west, Ramani on the north, Gaul, G-A-U-L-E on the east, and Terra Incognita, Kalelus. On the south, down the shaft of the Nahushtan. So, I mean, you know, you can call Kalelus the entire America. Uh, Daniel Lowe in the Forbidden Histories of America calls it literally just uh, the kingdom of America, Kalelus. So, dig on it. <laughs> down the shaft of the Nahushtan or the Draka, close to the picture of this diagram run the Hebrew words Shemona Paeth Paeth P E O T H Shemona S H E M O N A, which surely referring to the diagram must mean eight segments or eight divisions, i.e., the basic four quarters plus four square projections. It says the unknown land Kalelus apparently refers broadly to America and narrowly to the territory of the colony. Or we're just talking the four corners, you know, or this particular area in America. And again, we're in India Superior. The puzzling word Kalelus looks Latin but isn't unless derived from that barely possible Calabrian synagogue. Otherwise, it is a Latinized form of a foreign word. For instance, Ka'al, he has redeemed. So they're trying to break down the word Kalelus, which part is we got before, just looking at it again for the first time with a dragonfly perspective. So this Kalelus, just like Daniel Lowe talk about, means promised land. You got Cyclone Covey also breaking that down, that it means he has redeemed or the redeemed land. So we had to go back to the redeemed land. My life. You can't genealogy your way into this redeemed land. <laughs> it don't care about your paperwork. It's for a people. It's for a seed of people. It's for a remnant that never dies. Other possibilities based on phonemis 
Horton came up with include beautiful land or good land from Greek kalos, good or beautiful, fulfilled promise from Hebrew kala to complete or accomplish, fulfilled promised land. They just said what? Broadly, it represents America, right? On page 45, the unknown land Kalelus apparently represents or refers to America. Broadly, it refers to America. And we're calling it what? The fulfilled promised land to accomplish, to complete country. Oh, and then they try to flip it to country of the curse. So now it's a cursed land, with cursed people in it, right? <laughs> but that's not too far from the truth when you talk about being out of cold. Either you Baruch or you ain't Baruch. <laughs> Either you keep the code or you ain't in code. So it could be a beautiful promised land and it could be a cursed land depending on which lane you want to be in for the dismount. It says to make light of or vast surroundings from Hebrew kalal to surrender or comprise or to include. The colony identified itself also with the doomed or domed tholos, almost like Thanos, <laughs> T-H-O-L-O-S, temple, found engraved on the B side of the cross, number artifact six, and on both sides of the labyrinth, number 13. The reverse of the latter depicts this temple with a simple cross inside and a patriarchal cross atop the label T.O.B. Perhaps mistakenly puts in the periods for Tob or Tob, T O B, which appears on the knob of number artifact Hebrew for good. <laughs> so again, man, they don't know, right? They don't know. The reoccurring hyphenated initials VOE remain baffling and isolated Roman S on each of the artifact six might stand for Sonatus. So they see an S, they say, uh, maybe that's Sonatus. <laughs> like it could be anything that starts with an S, but here comes their conjecture. So it must it must be Sonatus, N A uh, excuse me, uh, S E N A T U S. On shaft of six B had met councils of the Senate on ancient Roman coins. So they compare with Roman coins. And this is a Hebrew kingdom. Has nothing to do with your Roman coin. <laughs> but they see an S and it must mean Senate and Senatus. Right? So this is when they're trying to, uh, you know, make a connection that may or may not be there. The similarity isolated R, similarly, similarly isolated Roman R, uh, number 6B and 7B, would by context stand for Rex, King, rather than for Roma or Romani. <laughs> so the R must stand for Rex, King, and not Romani, Priest King. But this is them on that play. These are people playing with your artifacts, playing with your things and playing with your stuff. And you've seen it here in real time. Whether they're looking at it from the Wake Forest perspective in 1970 or the Smithsonian perspective or the American or Arizona State Museum perspective, University of Arizona perspective. But they know we're talking about kings and royalty. They know we're talking about Israel and they know we're talking about a promised land, which is America. And this is Calais. Keep it wavy, my naga. Appreciate y'all tuning in. Kalelu's fourth wave. You already know what it is. Episode 24. And we on the pop. You know, the water for allowing us to be framed in shape in real time. And overcome everything we got to go overcome, man. And in, in, in real life, man. You know what I mean? Um, just to get here to you is always a checkpoint. And every time you're listening in, it's always a checkpoint, you know. We're all connected in the ether. The Wada for tuning in and surfing away. Shallow.
Yeah, man.